to take you on a journey today. Imagine it's the year 2040, and all of you are some of the first settlers on Mars, and you've just finished your very first surveillance mission. You went around scouting, and you've been checking things out, and now you're coming back into the habitat, and you're about to go in. You need to ask permission to take off your suits in the airlock, uh, and you, you'll be decompressed before you go into the, uh, into the hab itself. And so you would say, the lead, the whoever was leading this mission would say, EVA lead to HABCOM, permission to enter the airlock, over. And so this is a diverse team. All of us here are very diverse. We have uh, our commanding officer, we have the executive officer, we have a health and safety officer, there's an engineer, a geologist, and of course there's also an artist in residence. Uh, we all come from different backgrounds in different countries and different education, and all of us are united by our passion to explore the unknown. And you will hear from the HABCOM if everything checks out, they will say, HABCOM to EVA lead, permission granted, you may now enter the airlock. So this is an example of a standard interaction protocol between an astronaut crew stationed on Mars or the moon and a local team coming back from an extravehicular activity, or it's called EVA. So this is a simulation. We're not really on Mars. Uh, but we are still using our full body suits, as you can see, with helmets, with full gear, to do the simulation. And if you don't follow this protocol, you die and you can kill your entire crew. Um, I'm happy to report I've done this uh, simulation multiple times, and I have not killed myself nor my crew. <laughs> um, so since early 2019, I've done four uh, analog astronaut missions, each lasting about five days, and uh, one of the missions, I was even the crew commander. And so you might be thinking, why would somebody do something like this? So I work at the intersections of experiential futures, social research, and design. And as a futurist, I'm interested in mega trends, things that are going to be impacting us collectively that are happening in the future. As a social researcher, I'm interested in studying human behaviors as we transition through these changes. And as a designer, I'm interested in designing strategic interventions to help people transition and adopt to these changes. I'm researching edge cases of how communities come together and build resilience through change. So this year, the research has taken me to do these analog astronaut missions. I'm interested in how space exploration can impact life on Earth, both from a technological perspective as well as a cultural and sociolo sociological evolutionary perspective. We're living in a time that's being called liminal space, and this is the time in between. We know the things that, the known, where we have been, is already gone, and we still don't really know what may be. There's so many transitions that are happening all at once. Everything from climate change to new technology, synthetic biology, and becoming interplanetary species. We need tools to prototype and embody how these upcoming changes may impact us as a society and understand possible unintended consequences of all of these changes before they occur. And this is going to be really helpful for us as designers. And so experiential futures is actually a really powerful tool to help us deal with the unknown because it makes the intangible tangible. So designers and futurists and researchers will come together and they'll use different tools such as uh, speculative design, theater, uh, could also be using virtual reality and multimedia to create these experiential spaces. And within those experiential spaces, people can, uh, people can work, people can live, and this is something that we've done with analog astronaut missions. It's an experiential space where we can prototype different tools, see how people respond to these different tools, and also study 
behavior, behavioral patterns over time to see how people respond in these types of spaces be before they become reality. So to me, doing this Mars simulation has really been a useful way to embody new ways that humans can create new paradigms of living together. And through this research, I was also able to identify new strategic opportunities to design an intervention. So I'll give you some examples of what I mean. So the training that I've done is with an organization called Mars Academy USA, or MIU, and they pioneered the Mars Medics training programs, focusing on space medicine, health and wellness, and search and rescue. So in this picture, you can see we're testing a search and rescue protocol, and a result of this work, Mars Academy USA is now developing new technology to aid in search and rescue procedures, both uh, in space as well as on Earth. And here's another example, um, space medicine. We've undergone training on telesurgery and teleanesthesia, where, again, we are prototyping all these different surgical procedures, including intubation simulation using 3D printed devices and learning how to suture. And this part of the research is to identify how quickly people with no previous medical training can learn how to do basic medical procedures or some of these medical procedures with the guidance of a telesurgery team and being guided by a remote surgical team. And so, this is really useful for advancement of telemedicine, again, here on Earth as well as in space. And so some of the other uh, experiments that I was involved in, uh, we've tested different governance models, so how we go about making decisions. There's been different nutrition and diet models, uh, all kinds of scouting technologies, uh, soil sample collection techniques, and various communication techniques. And so what I was really most interested in is human relations and resilience. As I mentioned earlier, I'm interested in community resilience. And to me, this is really is the key, because we can have the best technologies, but if the crew doesn't get along, we're not, we're gonna, get, we're not gonna get really far. And if you think about when we actually are journeying to Mars, for real, we're gonna have our trip to get there, as well as settlements, and this crew is gonna have to work together at all the time. And there's something called isolated, confined, extreme environment. And there's a lot of research that's being done uh, by NASA and some of other organizations focusing on space to test how crews respond in these types of environments. And so this was part of the work and the research uh, that I was involved in. And so a lot of the crew bonding happens uh, before the mission itself, where we prepare ourselves not only physically, we prepare ourselves psychologically and emotionally. And during the mission itself, there are various activities designed and being tested for relieving stress and dealing with crew conflicts. And so as part of this process in my research, I actually ended up developing a, a virtual reality conflict resolution training application to support people who are going through these missions to learn about conflict resolution tools because I have a background in conflict resolution. And so this app works like a game and you're one of the players in virtual reality and you go through the different modules and learn uh, how to resolve conflict with a virtual reality player and then once you unplug, you continue learning and sharing that with your actual crew. So this is a famous photograph. Um, it's called Earth Rise. Many of you have probably seen it. It was taken 51 years ago on Christmas Eve 1968 on the Apollo 8 mission. And it was declared the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. Because this was an opportunity for humans to really get to know ourselves. We went out into space to explore the unknown. And yet, when we took the telescope and we pointed it back at us, this was a really crucial image to really help us think and immobilize a movement on environmental and social issues. And so, for me, this type of research and space exploration is important because we're learning a lot about ourselves. As climate-related disasters become more frequent and unpredictable, 
and larger in scales, we'll have to work very, very closely together and we'll have to collaborate. And this type of work that I've been studying, community resilience, really moves, moves us forward and gives us some new research tools. And my hope is that as we continue to explore out there and start identifying ourselves as interplanetary species, we learn to appreciate what we have here on this planet and work to, together to develop and accelerate solutions. And I just want to leave you with this final quote by Margaret Mead. Human future is something which lies within our hands to be shaped and molded by the choices we make in present time. And so as we move into 2020, I really believe that as designers, we have an incredible opportunity to shape our future for a more sustainable and a better world. Thank you.